trying to tell me you're a philanthropist? I demanded. Business is philanthropy in a way, she answered calmly. You need money and I need your services. To that extent, we're doing each other a favor. I think you'll find that the favor I'm going to do for you is a pretty considerable one. Would you mind picking up the envelopes on the table? I took the stack and stared at the top envelope. May 15th, 1931, I read aloud and looked suspiciously at her. What's this for? I don't think it's something that can be explained. At least it's never been possible before and I doubt it would be now. I'm assuming you want both cash and bank accounts, is that right? Well, yes, only we'll discuss it later. She looked along a row of shelves against one wall, searching the labels on the stacks of bundles there. She drew one out and pushed it towards me. Please open that and put on the things you'll find inside. I tore open the bundle. It contained a very plain business suit, black shoes, shirt, tie, and hat with a narrow brim. Are these supposed to be my burial clothes? I asked you to put them on, she said. If you want me to make that a command, I'll do it. I looked at the gun and I looked at the clothes and then for some shelter I could change behind. There wasn't any. She smiled. You didn't seem concerned about my modesty. I don't see why your own should bother you. Get dressed. I obeyed, my mind anxiously chasing one possibility after another, all of them ending up with my death. I got into the other things and felt even more uncomfortable. They were all only an approximate fit, the shoes a little too tight and pointed, the collar of the shirt too stiffly starched and too high under my chin, the gray suit too narrow at the shoulders and the ankles. I wished I had a mirror to see myself in. I felt like an ultra-conservative Wall Street broker and I was sure I resembled one. All right, she said. Put the envelopes in your inside pocket. You'll find instructions on each. Follow them carefully. I don't get it, I protested. You will. Now step into the mesh cage. Use the envelopes in the order they're arranged in. But what's this all about? I can tell you just one thing, Mr. Weldon. Don't try to escape. It can't be done. Your other questions will answer themselves if you follow the instructions on the envelopes. She had the gun in her hand. I went into the mesh cage, not knowing what to expect, and yet too afraid of her to refuse. I didn't want to wind up dead of starvation, no matter how much money she might have given me, but I didn't want to get shot either. So she closed the mesh gate and pushed the switch as far as it would go. The motor screamed as they picked up speed. The mesh cage vibrated more swiftly. I could see her through it as if there was nothing between us, and then I couldn't see her at all. I was outside a bank on a sunny day in spring. My fear evaporated instantly. I had escaped somehow. But then a couple of realizations slapped me from each side. It was day instead of night. I was out on the street and not in a brownstone house. Even the season had changed. Dazed, I stared at the people passing by. They looked like characters in a TV movie. Women wearing long dresses and flower pot hats. Their faces made up with petulant rosebud mouths and bright blotches of rouge. The men in hard straw hats and suits with narrow shoulders. Plain black or brown shoes. The same kind of clothes I was wearing. The rumble of traffic in the street caught me next. Cars with square bodies, tubular radiators. For a moment I let terror soak through me. Then I remembered the mesh cage and the motors. May Roberts could have given me electroshock, kept me under long enough for the seasons to change, or taken me south and left me on the street in daylight. But this was a street in New York. I recognized it, though some of the buildings seemed changed. The people dressed more shabbily. Shrewd stage setting? Hypnosis? That was it, of course. She'd hypnotized me except that a subject under hypnosis doesn't know he's been hypnotized. Completely confused, I took out the stack of envelopes I put in my pocket. I was supposed to have both cash and a bank account, and I was outside a bank. She obviously wanted me to go in, so I did. I handed the top envelope to the teller. He hauled $150 out of it and looked at me as if that was enough to buy and sell the bank. He asked me if I had an account there. I didn't. He took me over to an officer of the bank, a fellow with a Hoover collar and a John Gilbert mustache, who signed me up more cordially than I've been treated in years. I walked out to the street, gaping at the entry of the bank book he'd handed me. My pulse was jumping lumpily, my lungs refusing to work right, my head doing a Hopi rain dance. The date he'd stamped was May 15th, 1931. I didn't know which I was more afraid of, being stranded, middle-aged, and the worst of the depression, or being yanked back to that brownstone house. I only had an instant to realize I was a kid in high school uptown right at that moment. Then the whole scene vanished as fast as blinking and I was outside another bank somewhere else in the city. The date on the envelope was May 29th and it was still 1931. I made a $75 deposit there, then $100 at another place a few days later, and so forth, spending only a few minutes each time and going forward anywhere from a couple of days to almost a month. 
Every now and then I had a stamped addressed envelope to mail at a corner box. They were addressed to different stockbrokers and when I got one open before mailing it and took a look inside, it turned out to be an order to buy a few hundred shares of a stock in a soft drink company in the name of Dr. Anthony Roberts. I hadn't remembered the price of the shares being that low. The last time I'd seen the quotation, it was more than five times as much as it was then. I was making dough myself, but I was doing even better for May Roberts. A few times I had to stay around for an hour or so. There was the night I found myself in a flashy speakeasy with two envelopes that I was to bet the contents of, according to the instructions on the outside. It was June 21st, 1932, and I had to bet on Jack Sharkey to take the heavyweight title away from Max Schmeling. The place was serious and quiet. No more than three women, a couple of bartenders, and the rest male customers, including two cops, huddling up close to the radio. An affable character was taking bets. He gave me a wise little smile when I put the money down on Sharky. Well, it's a pleasure to do business with a man who wants an American to win, he said. And the hell with the smart dough, eh? Yeah, I said, and tried to smile back. But so much of the smart money was going on Schmeling that I wondered if May Roberts hadn't made a mistake. I couldn't remember who had won. You know what J.P. Morgan said, don't sell America short. I'll take a buck for my share, said a sour guy who barely managed to stand. Lousy grass growing in the lousy streets, nobody working, no future, nothing. We'll come out of it okay, I told him confidently. He snorted into his gin. Not in our lifetime, Mac. It'd take a miracle to put this country on its feet again. I don't believe in miracles. He put a scowling face up close to mine and breathed blearily and belligerently at me. Do you? Shut up, Gus, one of the bartenders said. The fight started. I had some tough moments and a lot of bad scotch listening. It went the whole 15 rounds. Sharky won, and I was in almost as bad shape as Gus, who'd passed out halfway through the battle. All I can recall is the affable character handing over a big roll and saying, lucky for me more guys don't sell America short, and trying to separate the money into the right amounts and put them in the right envelopes, while stumbling out of the door, when everything changed and I was outside a bank again. I thought, my God, what a hangover cure. I was as sober as if I hadn't had a drink when I made that deposit. There were more envelopes to mail, more deposits to make, and more bets to put down on Singing Wood in 1933 at Belmont Park and Max Bayer over Primo Carnera, and then Cavalcade at Churchill Downs in 1934, and James Braddock over Bayer in 1935, and a big daily double payoff when Noah Arke at Tropical Park, and so on, skipping through the years like a flat stone over water, touching here and there for a few minutes to an hour at a time. I kept the envelopes for May Roberts and myself in different pockets, and the bank books in another. The envelopes were beginning to bulge, and the deposits and accrued interest were something to watch grow. The whole thing, in fact, was so exciting that it was early October of 1938, a total of maybe four or five hours subjectively, before I realized what she had me doing. I wasn't thinking much about the fact that I was time traveling or how she did it. I accepted that, though. The sensation in some way was creepy, like raising the dead. My father and mother, for instance, were still alive in 1938. If I could break away from whatever it was that kept pulling me jumpily through time, I could go and see them. The thought attracted me enough to make me shake badly with intent, yet pump dread through me. I wanted so damn badly to see them again, and I didn't dare. I couldn't. Why couldn't I? Maybe the machine covered only the area around the various banks, speakeasies, bars, and horse parlors. If I could get out of the area, whatever it might be, I could avoid coming back to whatever May Roberts had lined up for me. Because naturally, I knew what I was doing. I was making deposits and winning sure bets just as the senile psychotics had done. The ink on their bank books and bills was fresh, because it was fresh. It wasn't given a chance to oxidize. At the rate I was going, I'd be back to my own time in another few hours or so, with $15,000 of better in deposits, compound interest, and cash. If I'd been around 70, you see, she could have sent me back to the beginning of the century with the same amount of money, which would have accumulated to something like $30,000. Get it now? I did, and I felt sick and frightened. The old people had died of starvation somehow with all that dough and cash or banks. I didn't give a hang if the time travel was responsible or something else was. I wasn't going to be found dead in my hotel and have Lou Pape curse my corpse because I've been borrowing from him when since 1931 I had a little fortune put away. He'd call me a premature senile psychotic and he'd be right, from his point of view, not knowing the truth. Rather than make the deposit in October 1938, I grabbed a battered old cab and told the driver to step on it. When I showed him the $10 bill that was in it for him, he squashed down the gas pedal. In 1938, $10 was real money. We got a mile away from the bank and the driver looked at me in the rearview mirror. How far you want me to go, mister? My teeth were together so hard that I had to unclench them before I could answer. As far away as we can get. Cops after you? 
No, but somebody is. Don't be surprised at anything that happens, no matter what it is. You mean like getting shot at? He asked worriedly, slowing down. You're not in any danger, friend. I am. Relax and step on it again. I wondered if she could still reach me, this far from the bank, and handed the guy the bill. No justice, sticking him with the ride in case she should. He pushed the pedal down even harder than he'd been doing before. We must have been close to three miles away when I blinked and was standing outside the first bank I'd seen in 1931. I don't know what the cab driver thought when I vanished out of his hack. Probably figured I'd open the door and jumped while he wasn't looking. Maybe even went back and searched for a body splashed all over the street. Well, it would have been a hopeless hunt. I was a week ahead. I gave up and drearily made my deposit. The one from early October I'd missed, I put in with this one. There was no way to escape the babe with the beautiful hard face, gorgeous warm body, and plans for me that all seemed to add up to death. I didn't try anymore. I went on making deposits, mailing orders to her stockbrokers and putting down bets that couldn't miss because they were all past history. I don't even remember what the last one was, a fight or a race. I hung around the bar that had so long ago replaced the speakeasy until the inevitable payoff. Got myself a hamburger and headed out the door. All the envelopes I was supposed to use were gone and I felt shaky, knowing that the next place I'd see was the room with the wire mesh cage and the hooded motors. It was. She was on the other side of the cage, and I had five bank books and envelopes filled with cash amounting to more than $15,000. But all I could think of was that I was hungry and something had happened to the hamburger while I was traveling through time. I must have fallen and dropped it because my hand was covered with dust or dirt. I brushed it off and quickly felt my face and pulled up my sleeves to look at my arms. Very smart, I said, but I'm nowhere near emaciation. What made you think you would be, she asked. Because the others always were. She cut the motors to idling speed and the vibrating mesh slowed down. I glared at her through it. God, she was lovely. As lovely as an ice sculpture. The kind of face she'd love to kiss and slap. Kiss and slap. You came here with a preconceived notion, Mr. Weldon. I'm a businesswoman, not a monster. I'd like to think there's even a good deal of the altruist in me. I could hire only young people, but the old ones have more trouble finding work. And you've seen for yourself how I provide nest eggs for them they'd otherwise never have. And take good care of yourself at the same time. That's the businesswoman in me. I need money to operate. So do the old people. Only they die and you don't. She opened the gate and invited me out. I make mistakes occasionally. I sometimes pick men and women who prove to be too old to stand the strain. I try not to let it happen, but they need money and work so badly that they don't always tell the truth about their age and state of health. You could take those who have social security cards and references, but those who don't have any are in worse need. She paused. You probably think I want only the money you and they bring back, that it's merely some sort of profit-making scheme. It isn't. You mean the idea is not just to build up a fortune for you with a cut for whoever helps you do it? I said I need money to operate, Mr. Weldon, and this method serves. But there are other purposes, much more important. What you've gone through is basic training, you might say. You know now that it's possible to travel through time and what it's like. The initial shock, in other words, is gone, and you're better equipped to do something for me in another era. Something else? I stared at her puzzledly. What else could you want? Let's have dinner first. You must be hungry. I was, and that reminded me. I bought a hamburger just before you brought me back. I don't know what happened to it. My hand was dirty and the hamburger was gone, as if I'd fallen somehow and dropped it and got dirt on my hand. She looked worriedly at the hand, probably afraid I'd cut it and disqualify myself. I could understand that. You never know what kind of diseases can be picked up in different times, because I remember reading somewhere that germs keep changing according to conditions. Right now, for instance, strains of bacteria are becoming resistance to antibiotics. I knew her concern wasn't really for me, but it was pleasant all the same. That could be the explanation, I suppose, she said. The truth is that I've never taken a time voyage. Somebody has to operate the controls in the present, so I can't say it's possible or impossible to fall. It must be, since you did. Perhaps the wrench back from the past was too violent and you slipped just before you returned. She led me down to an ornate dining room, where the table had been set for two. The food was waiting on the table, steaming and smelling tasty. Nobody was around to serve us. She pointed out a chair to me and we sat down and began eating. I was a little nervous at first, afraid there might be something in the food, but it tasted fine and nothing happened after I swallowed a little and waited for some effect. You did try to escape the time tractor beam, didn't you, Mr. Weldon? She asked. I didn't have to answer, she knew. That's a mistaken notion of how it functions. The control beam doesn't cover area, it covers era. You could have flown to any part of the world and the beam still would have brought you back. Do I make myself clear? She did. Too bloody clear. I waited for the rest. I assume you've already formed an opinion of me, she went on. A rather unflattering one, I imagine. 
Bitch is the cleanest word I can find, but a clever one. Anybody who could invent a time machine would have to be a genius. I didn't invent it. My father did, Dr. Anthony Roberts, using the funds you and others helped me provide him with. Her face grew soft and tender. My father was a wonderful man, a great man, but he was called a crackpot. He was kept from teaching or working anywhere. It was just as well, I suppose, though he was too hurt to think so. He had more leisure to develop the time machine. He could have used it to extort repayment from mankind for his humiliation, but he didn't. He used it to help mankind. Like how, I goaded. It doesn't matter, Mr. Weldon. You're determined to hate me and consider me a liar. Nothing I tell you can change that. She was right about the first part. I hadn't dared let myself do anything except hate and fear her. But she was wrong about the second. I remember thinking how Lou Pape would have felt if I had died of starvation with over $15,000 after borrowing from him all the time between jobs. Not knowing how I got it, he'd have been sore, thinking I'd played him for a patsy. What I'm trying to say is that Lou wouldn't have had enough information to judge me. I didn't have enough information yet either to judge her. What do you want me to do? I asked warily. Everybody but one person was sent into the past on specific errands to save art, treasures, and relics that would otherwise have been lost to humanity. Not because the things might have been worth a lot of dough, I said nastily. You've already seen that I can get all the money I want. There were upheavals in the past, great fires, wars, revolutions, vandalism, and I had my associates save things that would have been destroyed. Oh, beautiful things, Mr. Weldon. The world would have been so much poorer without them. El Greco, for instance, I asked, remembering the raving old man who had been found wandering with $17,000 in his coat lining. El Greco, too. Several paintings that had been lost for centuries. She became more brisk and efficient seeming. Except for the one man I mentioned, I concentrated on the past. The future's too completely unknown to us. And there's an additional reason why I tentatively explored it only once. But the one person who went there discovered something that would be of immense value to the world. What happened to him? She looked regretful. He was too old. He survived just long enough to tell me that the future has something we need. It's a metal box small enough to carry that could supply this whole city with power to run its industries and light its homes and streets. Sounds good. Who'd you say benefits if I get it? We share the profits equally, of course, but it must be understood that we sell the power so cheaply that everybody can afford it. I'm not arguing. What's the other reason you didn't bother with the future? You can't bring anything from the future to the present that doesn't exist right now. I won't go into the theory, but it should be obvious that nothing can exist before it exists. You can't bring the box I want, only the technical data to build one. Technical data? I'm an actor, not a scientist. You'll have pens and weatherproof notebooks to copy it down in. I couldn't make up my mind about her. I've already said she was beautiful, which always prejudices a man in a woman's favor. But I couldn't forget the starvation cases. They hadn't shared anything but malnutrition, useless money, and death. Then again, maybe her explanation was a good one. That she wanted to help those who needed help most, and some of them lied about their age and physical condition because they wanted the job so badly. All I knew about were those who had died. How did I know there weren't others? A lot more than the fatal cases, perhaps, who came through all right and were able to enjoy their little fortunes. And there was a story about saving the treasures of the past and wanting to provide power at really low cost. She was right about one thing. She didn't need any of that to make money with. Her method was plenty good enough. Using the actual records of the past to invest in stocks, bet on sports, all sure gambles. But those starvation cases. Do I get any guarantees, I demanded. She looked annoyed. I'll need you for the data. You'll need me to turn it into manufacture. Is that enough of a guarantee? No. Do I come out of this alive? Mr. Weldon, please use some logic. I'm the one who's taken the risk. I've already given you more money than you've ever had at one time in your life. Part of my motive was to pay for services about to be rendered. Mostly it was to give you experience in traveling through time. And to prove to me that I can't run out, I added. That happens to be a necessary attribute of the machine. I couldn't very well move you about through time unless it worked that way. If you'd look at my point of view, you'd see that I lose my investment if you don't bring back the data. I can't withdraw your money, you realize. I don't know what to think, I said, dissatisfied with myself because I couldn't find out what, if anything, was wrong with the deal. I'll get you the data for the power box, if it's at all possible, and then we'll see what happens. Finished eating, we went upstairs and I got into the cage. She closed the circuit, the motor screamed, the mesh blurred, and I was in a world I never knew. You call it a city, I suppose. There were enough buildings to make it one, but no city ever had so much greenery. 
It wasn't just tree-lined streets like Unter den Linden in Berlin or islands covered with shrubbery like Park Avenue in New York. The grass and trees and shrubs grew around every building, separating them from each other by wide lawns. The buildings were more glass, or what looked like glass, than anything else. A few of the windows were opaque against the sun, but I couldn't see any shades or blinds, some kind of polarizing glass or plastic. I felt uneasy being there, but it was a thrill just the same, to be alive in the future when I and everybody who lived in my day was supposed to be dead. The air smelled like the country. There was no foul gas boiling from the teardrop cars on the glass level road. They were made of transparent plastic clear around and from top to bottom, and they moved along at a fair clip, but more smoothly than swiftly. If I hadn't seen the airship overhead, I wouldn't have known it was there. It flew silently, a graceful ball without wings, seeming to be borne by the wind from one horizon to the other, except that no wind ever moved that fast. One car stopped nearby and someone shouted, here we are. Several people leaped out and headed for me. I didn't think I ran. I crossed the lawn and ducked into the nearest building and dodged through the long, smoothly walled, shadowlessly lit corridors until I found a door that would open. I slammed it shut and locked it. Then, panting, I fell into a soft chair that seemed to form itself around my body and felt like kicking myself for the bloody idiot I was. What in the hell had I run for? They couldn't have known who I was. If I'd arrived at a time when people wore togas or bathing suits, there would have been some reason for singling me out. But they all had clothes just like ours. Suits and shirts and ties for the men, a dress and high heels for the one woman with them. I felt somewhat disappointed that clothes hadn't changed any, but it worked out to my advantage. I wouldn't be so conspicuous. Yet why should anyone have yelled, here we are, unless, no, they must have thought I was somebody else. It didn't figure any other way. I had run because it was my first startled reaction and probably because I knew I was there in what might be considered illegal business. If I succeeded, some poor inventor would be done out of his royalties. I wish I hadn't run. Besides making me feel like a scared fool, I was sweaty and out of breath. Playing old men doesn't make climbing down fire escapes much tougher than it should be, but it doesn't exactly make a sprinter out of you, not by several lungfuls. I sat there, breathing hard and trying to guess what next. I had no more idea of where to go for what I wanted than an ancient Egyptian sat down in the middle of Times Square with instructions to sneak a mummy out of the Metropolitan Museum. I didn't even have that much information. I didn't know any part of the city, how it was laid out, or where to get the data that May Roberts had sent me for. I opened the door quietly and looked both ways before going out. After losing myself in the cross-connecting corridors a few times, I finally came to an outside door. I stopped, tense, trying to get my courage. My inclination was to slip, sneak, or dart out, but I made myself walk away, like a decent, innocent citizen. That was one disguise they'd never be able to crack. All I had to do was act as if I belonged to that time and place, and who would know the difference? There were other people walking as if they were in no hurry to get anywhere. I slowed down to their speed, but I wished wistfully that there was a crowd to dive into and get lost. A man dropped in a step and said politely, Beg your pardon, are you a stranger in town? I almost halted in alarm, but that might have been a giveaway. What makes you think so? I asked, forcing myself to keep at the same easy pace. I didn't recognize your face, and I thought, It's a big city, I said coldly. You can't know everyone. If there's anything I can do to help... I told him there wasn't and left him standing there. It was plain common sense. I had decided quickly while he was talking to me not to take any risks by admitting anything. I might have been dumped into a police state or the country could have been at war without my knowing it. Or maybe they were suspicious of strangers. For one reason or another, ranging from vagrancy to espionage, I could be pulled in, tortured, executed, God knows what. The place looked peaceful enough, but that didn't prove a thing. I went on walking, looking for something I couldn't be sure existed, in a city I was completely unfamiliar with, in a time when I had no right to be alive. It wasn't just a matter of getting the information she wanted. I'd have been satisfied to hang around until she pulled me back without the data. But then what would happen? Maybe the starvation cases were people who had failed her. For that matter, she could shoot me and send the remains anywhere in time to get rid of the evidence. Damn it. I didn't know if she was better or worse than I'd supposed, but I wasn't going to take any chances. I had to bring her what she wanted. Thank you for listening to this podcast. If you like what you hear, head over to my Patreon at patreon.com slash Kelsey Narrates and help support me by becoming a patron for as little as $3 a month. I'm not going to get rich doing this, but it does take money to keep a podcast running. All patrons get early access to every episode I publish. 
This ebook is for the use of anyone, anywhere, at no cost, and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away, or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license, available at gutenberg.org.